There is a tang in the salt air, something in the sweep of ocean waters rolling in and out through creeks and rivers, in the breezes coming in from the ocean that exhilarates the human being. I was a lad whose greatest delight in life was to go in the marsh with my elders, and the procedure had been the same for over 200 years. Those days in the marsh, cutting, raking, and pulling in, and stacking the hay, I got great pride at the smooth mowed marsh we always left when work was done. What a thrill when the job was done. The marsh mowed smooth and the fine shapely stacks standing there, monuments to skillful labor. Roland Sawyer. The salt marshes formed during the end of the last ice age. As the glaciers were melting, the silt and debris that were trapped inside the, the ice was deposited at the, at the edge of the ice formations. They formed the barrier beaches that run up and down the east coast of the United States. Over time, behind those barrier beaches, water filled in from the ocean. It was very protected and very uh, calm back there. So silt and debris developed and um, over hundreds of years peat formed. With the peat you got salt marsh grass and hay and those are types of vegetation that occur nowhere else in the world. And that's what makes the salt marsh such, such a unique place. It's uh, flooded with seawater, makes a perfect ocean's nursery. It's protected, there aren't any huge waves, it's like a sponge, so fresh water coming in is absorbed, and it's a perfect place for the ocean's nursery. The Aboriginal people uh, along the east coast of the United States value the salt marsh above everything else. They used it for their main food source. They um, hunted there, they fished there, game congregated along the salt marsh uh, during the evening and the, and, um, the early morning hours, so that's where they hunted. About this time, 1638 to 1639, a settlement was set down at Winnicunnet. The people who settled being enticed by the large tract of salt marsh, which would furnish fodder for their cattle till lands could be cleared. Roland Sawyer. First called the plantation of Winnicunnet, an Abenaki word meaning pleasant pines, Hampton was one of four original New Hampshire townships, the only one charted by the General Court of Massachusetts. The other towns, Exeter, Dover, and Strawberry Bank, would come under Massachusetts authority a few years later. In March of 1635, Richard Dummer and John Spencer came round in their shallop at the landing and were impressed by the location. Dummer, who was a member of the General Court of Massachusetts, had the court lay its claim to the section for a plantation there. The town was settled in 1638 by a group of parishioners led by the Reverend Stephen Batchelor, who had formerly preached at the settlement's namesake, Southampton, England. Incorporated in 1639, the township originally included the seacoast towns of Seabrook, Hampton Falls, Northampton, and pots of rye. This is the story of how the salt marsh hay of New Hampshire's seacoast assisted in its early settlement, contributed to its economy, and sustained a region well into the 20th century. Surely the group of settlers were so happy in their selection of a spot on which to settle, as were Father Bachelor and his little band who came to Winnicunnet, just as before him the Indian people had been most happy in their selection of this spot for their habitat. Roland Sawyer. When the early settlers in 1638 came to Hampton, they brought their cattle with them and the salt hay gave to them the uh, salt hay they needed uh, for their cattle. It was really highly prized. It was higher in nutrition than normal hay. 
had salt in it. You didn't need to use salt licks or um, supplement the feed for the cattle. This allowed them for their dairy cattle and their beef cattle to have a far more nutritious source of hay for them. The settlers of Hampton discovered that the salt hay was a resource with multiple uses. They also used it for insulation around their houses. They packed it in to keep it nice and warm. Our New England winters obviously are a little colder than England was at the time. When we say insulate, probably up to below the windows on the first floor. Farmers found the salt hay had a unique quality to it, making it suitable as a fertilizer. The hay doesn't germinate unless it's in salt water, so there were no weeds. It was perfect mulch for their gardens. By the late 19th century, the demand for salt marsh hay grew across the state of New Hampshire. This demand intensified the harvesting of the marsh and contributed to the seacoast economy. What salt hay they did not use, they actually sold in the surrounding communities. Practically every town or city would have a hay market square, and once a year, usually in the late season, which would be late October, November, uh, November, after all the hay had been cut, the men would actually uh, load up hay cart wagons full of hay. The, kid, the boys loved this because this meant that they actually would take a, a trip. They would actually uh, drive their wagon and horses uh, full, full of hay, sell not only the hay but the wagon. And then the boys, of course, would love this. They would uh, ride back to Hampton. They had money for the uh, for the winter, and during the winter of the non-haying, less active season, they would build another wagon. All, all of their uh, income would be actually expended in the immediate area. The early farmers, and subsequent farmers, used the marsh as the backbone for their farm. So this became uh, clearly, in my mind, the, the part of the lifeblood of this farming community. This is actually creating a lot of jobs, stop and think about it. It's a lot of agricultural work. This creates a little local industry. You, you had this, this, this vast area of hay and this vast demand for it from the dairy cattle and the beef cattle industry. There's a tremendous activity going out of rye. Also, there's a tremendous amount of salt marsh hay going out of here because that was in demand wherever they didn't, you know, especially upriver where they didn't have access to the salt marshes. This demand provided the farmers of Seabrook, Hampton Falls, Hampton, Northampton, and Rye with a profitable harvest by late August. The marsh cutting in the August season was something to remember. The weather was nice, more dependable, very little rain if any, not even a thunderstorm that I can remember. Besides accomplishing so much, we had a good time not only working on the marsh, but in seeing so many people we wouldn't see otherwise. John Fogg. In August, the entire community would come down to the salt marsh for about two weeks. They'd camp along the upper marsh, um, they'd bring tents, they'd stay there for two weeks. Uh, the entire families would be there. It was a, a congregational um, setting where they'd play and work. When the farmers came to cut the marsh hay, they camped at the rocks, a landing at the end of Old Rocks Road in Seabrook, where they could have campfires. They had two horses, a tent, and all the equipment that goes with cutting hay and camping. We boys would do the chores, load up the wagon with provisions for Jake and Father, and the lunches for all of us. Father would meet us at the rocks dock with the boat. Mother would drive us down, so to take the team back home. John Fogg. You go back and you read history, everybody worked. Everybody knew the value of hard work, and, and everybody pitched in. That to me is a family value. I don't know what other people's ideas about family values are, but when you talk about hard work, and we look back at these people, and, and it's just it was a natural thing. You didn't question it, because you couldn't survive without women and children and the older men. I mean, everybody was involved. The family had to work together to live, and this is one way in which they did it. The harvesting began at dawn, while the grass was still moist and firm for the cutting. 
We must be on the marsh with size hing and ready to swing down the swath by 4 a.m., so to get four hours work before the dew was off. This was the procedure. The grass would cut much easier and better in early morning when the dew was on. So the women folks on the farms or in the homes were up at 1 a.m. to get breakfast and put up dinners in the baskets and boxes so we could drive out of the yard at 2 or 2.30 a.m. at the latest. Roland Sawyer. You always cut the uh, salt hay before sun up while the dew was still on it. If you tried to cut it once it dries, it's like cutting wire. It's impossible. Haying the marsh was really difficult. The men would come down and they'd line up along the salt marsh about six feet apart with a, a hand sigh and they're very deadly weapons. And they'd count and they'd step and they'd sigh. They'd count, they'd step and they'd sigh all in unison and then they'd cut with a scythe. Yeah, normally that was the old way of doing it with the scythe. Going back to the days when work on New England farms was done by hand labor, one of the most important places where endurance and skill counted was in the swinging of the scythe. Certain families prided themselves on their ability to swing the scythe and on the way that they taught their sons and grandsons to do the same. Our own forebears were very skillful in the use of the scythe, and I have never seen the man who could keep his scythe sharp, cut as clean a swath, and do it as neatly as my father, Roland Sawyer. What I love about the scythe, it's like an extension of your whole body. And you just, you know, you visualize that rhythm and making sure that, and having to constantly sharpen that thing, because you can imagine how that got dulled up with those grasses depending upon the man and how strong he would be. Because once he got started, it was a rhythm. And uh, once you get into a rhythm, you know what you're doing. But until you can get started, you, 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 you've got to watch yourself. And especially if they always work in, in harmony with one another. It's great, because otherwise you just take, you lose, it, lose a leg. And if one person made a mistake, you could just cut your neighbor right off. It was very, very dangerous. People were getting hurt all the time doing it. In fact, uh, ha Hampton had three or four taverns, and during the so-called meadow season, they, the taverns were not allowed to be open until after the mowing was done for the, the cutting and mowing was done for the day. I was always told never to lay a scythe down, but just hang it up in a tree or in some place around the house. If I was on the marsh, I was always to stand it up by pushing the small end on the scythe stay into the marsh. Well, this day Andy Fogg and Charlie Dalton were mowing near Walton Road Dock where someone laid a scythe down. The horses stepped on it, flipping the scythe up and into to the horse's chest. By the time the horse had stopped jumping around, he was pretty badly cut, John Fogg. As time went by, the farmers got much more um, elaborate in how they hayed the marsh. What they did next was to start taking their, their oxen and their uh, horses into the marsh. And in order to do that, obviously, it's really soft and there's a lot of holes um, and dangerous spots for animals. So they built shoes for, their, for the animals called bog shoes. They're wood on the bottom and they um, they have leather straps and then metal as the time went on uh, and, and hopefully those would keep the animals from sinking in. Each farmer had a secret way of, of making their, their shoes and you know they didn't want anybody else to see what it looked like so they'd strap things around it. And I look at those bog shoes and I'm still trying to imagine the horses wearing them. So I think what you, I think they really had to watch for particularly low tides. Even at low tide, it's still pretty mucky, so I'm sure they had all kinds of problems. The, the peat is very soft. It's over 100 feet deep in places, and it, it's like a sponge, so it's very difficult to walk on. You have to be very careful. I don't know if you've ever been out on the marsh and gone down into a sinkhole. 
yourself, you know, you literally have to cut yourself out because it's like quick, not hot quick sand, it's like quick mud. I was out in the marsh. I discovered a uh, peddler's wagon that was uh, in ruins. We dated it about 10, 15 years after the Civil War. And evidently, a peddler had come through here many years ago and he got off the uh, high ground and got in there and got caught in the marsh and the, the wheel, the axle was broke and he had to leave it there. And we also found one horse with a bullet hole in its head. So evidently the horse, uh, they couldn't get the horse out and he probably got into the sinkhole. And of course a horse or an oxen being a huge animal would uh, be frightened, would wallow around and the more they wallowed around the deeper they got. So the only way you could do it uh, was actually to shoot them. Uh, they did lose a lot of animals in the marsh. There were two incidents with the horses while working on the marsh that I don't seem to forget. Ralph Fish was mowing near our marsh when the horse stepped into the edge of one of those grassed over salt ponds. And even though the horse fell, they had no trouble getting him up again. John True's horse got into one of those grassed over salt ponds and this time they did have some trouble getting him out. Someone went with a horse, pulled him out, but in doing so ruptured the horse so that it died some time later. John Fogg. After the hay was cut, it needed to be raked into piles. Once they cut an area, they'd leave it for about a day to, to dry. The tides were low so it wouldn't wash away. And then the next day, the women and the children would come in and rake the hay into piles. We boys went the second day of mowing to rake and caulk it up, so not to let it get too dry. It would hold then many days and not hurt until ready to stack. Now it's all mowed, raked, and caulked, ready to stack. John Fogg. I love those big hand hay rakes. I mean, the thing is about as wide as this room with a great big long handle. And of course, one person could pull that. And you get a tremendous amount of hay. The next day we came down again and raked it into windrows and cocked it up into a bunch twice as long as it was wide and which would weigh 50 to 100 pounds. Roland Soya. Mosquitoes and greenhead flies were a nuisance. Farmers were constantly bit while cutting and raking the salt marsh hay. They had an answer for the insect bites. They had to have their swigum and switchel with them at all times. And that was a drink that they spent all winter um, producing. The farmers took uh, jugs, put oat cakes in the bottom of the jugs and filled them with cider and it would uh, ferment over the winter. It's, you know, it's got lemon in it, it's got sugar. Now we know it had to have some rum in it because rum is what powered New England, whether it was maritime vessels or it was farming. But, but it could be non-alcoholic as well. So you had that sugar hit in there and some sort of lemon, but all of these fresh natural things that would, that would be put in there. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's some sort of seltzer kind of thing in there too. Now that drink father mixed up with a cup of oatmeal the molasses and ginger in the can of water. We kept that can in a ditch where it would be cool all day, if it lasted all day. John Fogg. They had to, had to drink um, a certain amount every hour to make sure that they were sweating. And I was told this by the last person in Hampton who actually uh, farmed the salt marsh, Sam Toll. He said you had to drink your, your swigum or switchel and you had to carry it with you and it made you sweat and those Got rid of the flies and the mosquitoes. You never, never got bit. I assume it was because you couldn't feel a thing <laughs> by the time you were done. And that was, everyone drank it. The kids, the women, everybody was drinking this. Once the hay had been cut, raked, and dried, the men returned with their hay poles. The pointed ends of the two hay poles were then pushed under the cocks of hay which were carried to a nearby cluster of staddles. They'd take two 12 to 15 foot poles, they're called hay poles, and stick them under the piles, one person on each end, and then they carry those, that hay over to uh, several, a staddle, um, set of staddles, uh, which are 
pieces of oak or cedar that ha are pointed on one end and pounded into the ground. They're about anywhere from five to six feet long, only about three feet would be above the ground. The rest would be pounded in. You, you'd have to force it. You'd get an iron bar to put into the, into the marsh and then you'd, you'd uh, make probably, I don't know, but there may be 75 to 100 staddles and those would hold the hay. The hay would be put on top of that so that while it was being stored, the tide could flow in and out without disturbing the haystack. Once that hay is cut, then they have got to get it up into a, a tight form so then they can get it up on those staddles so that it would be above the high tide mark, and as you know, so the water could go under the staddles there. Of course, uh, they can't just put hay on that because it would fall through, so they take driftwood, put it on top of the staddles, and then as they brought the hay over, there would be a couple men on top of the hay stacking it down. And then they'd, they'd pile it up into a sort of a conical type shape, and then with someone on top of the haystack taking the hay and then uh, moving it around. I don't know quite how they made it come out quite as, as uh, symmetrical as they did, but it did happen if you look at the old photos. As, as the sta stack got higher, the kids would be out, one child would be on top patting the hay down. That was a really important job. They pulled in enough hay for the stack and I raked the scatterings. When they got the bottom started, I laid the stack. When pitching, they had to watch how the stack was being laid out over the straddle. The one on the stack had no way of telling how it was looking. They needed some more hay to make a good top. We stacked an 11-foot straddle. Father called that a two-ton one. Another toward the Hampton Harbor East was smaller, say one and one-half ton, John Fogg. A young boy would also help them, and they loved that. The boys did, because when they got to the top of the saddle, they didn't jump off. They would actually slide off. In order to get down, though, he'd have to take in one of the, um, the hay poles and actually slide down it to get down. The kids had a really good time, I'm sure. Now to get down without a ladder, father would hand up the small end of a hay pole. He would hold the large end with both hands against his leg, and I was to come down holding to that hay pole on hands and knees, head first. Then, when I got halfway, turn over and jump. When I was coming down the pole, they would say, don't drag your feet. That would make holes or water pockets in the stack. John Fogg. So everybody had something to do. And the young boys, if they were a little bit older and couldn't cut, would tend to the horses. And then they'd put um, rope on top and then tie that into the bottom so that the uh, wind wouldn't, uh, you know, blow the hay stacks off, hay off from the stacks. Each farmer had a specific way that he kept the hay from, from falling. Some of them used um, uh, ropes with rocks on the end to keep them weighted. Some people used vines. Some people just let it sit for nature to take. Nature did not always cooperate with the salt hay farmers. There's a lot of stories about um, injuries, about people getting uh, stuck in the, in the marsh itself. Storm tides, I mean, they had no idea when a storm was coming, other than, you know, watching the clouds. So there were all sorts of injuries associated with the marsh. My mother, Sarah G. Fogg, told me a story about John Thayer Bachelor. One afternoon, he was going down to get a stack of hay. He was on his way down this day with his little boy and hired hand, Oliver Wright of Seabrook. It was on a low run of tide, but it seemed that there was a bad storm at sea that no one knew about and the tide was coming up. He was on the marsh when the tide started to come up, but not knowing that the tide was a low run, he didn't think much of it. As the tide kept coming, he decided to turn around and go back. But before he got near shore, the tide was so deep he could not see the path. He stopped. The hired man thought he knew the way and went on, but became lost in the river and drowned. John Thayer stayed, standing up in the pung and holding his son all night. He survived as did the oxen, but the horse died. John Fogg.
I think people stayed out too long as the tide was coming in. I think people got stuck. I think people died probably. I mean, there was all kinds of accidents. Orrin Green was on his way down one afternoon to get a stack of hay on that particular marsh when he went past Bachelors. David saw him and went out to tell him the tide would not be right when he was loaded and ready to cross back. David told him he should not go. The creek should not be any more than half full to be safe. Orrin had come this far and hated to go back. Well, he went down, loaded up. By this time, the creek was almost full, got almost across when the horse went in. He got them unhitched, but that was all. The horses drowned and Orrin Green died, but he didn't drown. He was probably kicked by one of the horses, John Fogg. When the harvest was complete, about a hundred haycocks would line the horizon of the salt marsh, creating a breathtaking scene. Farmers would then pitch the hay onto a hay loader or sled and haul it to a wide creek or river where it was loaded onto a gundalow, floated at high tide to the landing, pitched onto a hay wagon, and hauled to the farm. Or the haycock would remain there until the snow and ice of winter had settled on the marshland. The hay would then be pitched onto a sled and hauled away. If their home was close enough, they would bring wait till the, uh, it snowed and ice formed in the marsh, and they'd bring sleds down, and they'd take the hay back on sleds. Others used gundalos and um, small boats, and they would wait till there was a very high run tide and go in with a flat bottom boat and take the hay off the haystacks. Usually they didn't take the entire haystack at a time, they'd take what they needed. And that's when you would see, of course, the gundalos would come in at the right tide and be able to offload that hay. It was the usual way of coming up with a boat of hay. One man towed, another stood on the gundalo with a long oar on a pole. He kept the boat pushed away from the side of the river. And sometimes, coming up the broad water, two men would row, sitting in the front while at the stern, a man with another oar would steer, salt hay farmer. They floated out, put the hay on there, and it had to be, it had to be, it had to happen rather quickly because they had to get the hay, the gundalo back ashore where the landing was, and then pitch it onto the, um, the wagons and then haul it, haul it to wherever they're going. And uh, they would have a run of tide to actually get all of the hay onto these gundalos, and then they would be floated, poled upriver to the uh, nearby high ground where the horses would be there with, with the <coughs> hay cart. And, and they'd take all that hay and put it into the uh, uh, hay wagons and then take them away. There were many more of these docks in Seabrook. The Rocks Dock on the Browns River, Newell Browns Dock on Hunts Island, South Creek, the Farm Lane Dock, and the Walton Road Dock. All these landings had gundalows docked at these places. John Fogg. When gundalows were not floating up and down the canal stacked with salt hay, they were being used for recreation. Perhaps most vivid of all my memories of 1880-1885 are of those trips downriver. That was the trip down Hampton Falls River where my father would hire a boat all day. We would get there to go down as the tide ebbed, stayed, and dig clams, then fish, and come up when the tide was near full, thus being there 12 hours. And all the expense was 25 cents for the boat. What a day of delight to the boys from six to 11 years of age, Roland Sawyer. What I love about the gundalows is they were actually built by farmers. They weren't built by necessarily professional boat builders because they knew the shape of these things and they needed them. So at, at its height, there were, there were upwards of 200 gundalows sailing around, up, particularly upriver on these marshes. And uh, I love that construction because it, it, to me, interested in maritime history, it, that sail rigging is a throwback to the Felucas on the Nile River thousands of years ago. That short stump mass and that, that long spar that could swivel because 
all the tributaries off the Nile, there were bridges. And so those felucas had to drop their spar so it would be parallel to the vessel. They could go under those bridges and they could go where no other vessel could go. Sailing vessels. So, and that maritime technology came right over here and so you got the, the gondola was the variation of it, which I think is really cool. The crop was then stored in barns and used for fodder or mulch, or transported to the Haymarket squares. The hay, which was cut after the first frost, was sold for banking. In the late 19th century, with a booming tourism trade well underway, the population along the seacoast of New Hampshire began to increase. Because the haying industry was in decline, the marshes were viewed only as a breeding ground for insects such as green head flies and mosquitoes. Investments in real estate and the booming tourism trade was expanding and led to the demand for more housing and roads, causing landfill to replace both the beautiful barrier beach that once lined the coast and disrupting much of the ecosystem so important to a healthy salt marsh. The decline had to mainly do with agriculture, decline in agriculture. There were fewer and fewer farmers. Um, the Agricultural Society in Hampton was changing from agriculture to a more bedroom community for the cities, Portsmouth and uh, eventually Boston. And it was also a, a tourist destination in the 1800s. People were looking at the seacoast and thinking hotels and restaurants and houses and streets. In 1898, uh, they built the uh, bandstand and the casino. So people came here and uh, good people of Hampton discovered that if they uh, put all their efforts into about 15 weeks during the summer, as opposed to uh, working farms. They could make as much, if not more, and uh, work, work less. And there was just no, no, no need to, to have uh, any salt hay, so to speak. The federal government was, was doing, they were doing things to encourage building roads and filling in the salt marsh and draining the salt marsh so that you don't have any mosquito-borne illnesses, and um, that's what happened. And we had a massive amount of salt marsh along the east coast of the United States filled in. If you, if you ever go down to the marsh, you can't help but you know, fall in love with it. it. But it's important to know what the uses were and how important it was, because when you get an understanding of that, you have more of a, a feeling for wanting to keep that preserved. This is what uh, brought, in fact, it did bring Reverend Batchelder and the early uh, people of Hampton to this Puritan plantation because of the, of the salt marshes. For the first, we're, we're about almost 400 years young now. For about 300 years, the so salt marsh controlled their way of life. I found that there were so many stories about what went on in the marsh and the names of families that are still with us today. When, they, when my students hear that, they say, gee, I didn't know that. And they go home and they talk about it with their parents. And their parents uh, many times uh, actually ask me to come and talk to them about it. And they'll say, gee, we know a little bit more and are proud of our heritage now that we know a little bit more about it. I'm a biologist, so I, I'm not um, dealing in a lot of history, but uh, I do, when I do a salt marsh walk, we do things that get the kids really, really interested in being there. Make them think about when they drive by what's there, the smell. Smell sm smells like rotten eggs out there. And the first thing is, oh, gross. <laughs> That's a healthy salt marsh. Those anaerobic bacteria are working away, producing um, a chemical that gives off the sulfur smell, and that means you've got the healthiest salt marsh around. It's the, the bacteria de is a decomposition. It decays the organic material and produces nutrients 
for everything that's living in that salt marsh. You smell that, that marsh, you've got a healthy salt marsh and you've got lots of things growing. The aesthetic beauty of that open space. Thank God for salt marshes, you know?